This week's episode of Modern Art Family Tree is brought to you by the Foster Gallery. The Foster Gallery is a gallery in Worcester, Massachusetts, who specializes in paintings, drawings, and prints. Find them at www.thefostergallery.com. All right, this is Matthew Foster, and this is the um, Modern Art Family Tree podcast, uh, episode one, and I'm joined by Dennis Hart, who will be here with me every week discussing uh, a half-hour glimpse at famous artists who were involved in the modern painting movement. Um, and how are you doing, Dennis? I'm doing well. So um, this is our first show. And uh, the, the concept is really easy, right? Which is you walk into a place and people assume when you're at a museum that the only modern art on the wall is uh, abstract work or, or, you know, drip paintings or something that's uh, crazy. And Ab- then they look abstract at... Abstract expressionism. Yeah. And then they look at something that's a, mona, you know, an impressionist painting and they go, well, no, that's not modern. And as a painter, you sit there and go, uh, yeah, it is modern, actually, you know. So... Um, the concept of this show is to basically start with the grandfather of modern art, which I think everybody can can basically agree that it, it's Gustav Courbet. And from there, the idea of modern art spreads like wildfire and branches out into the very eclectic and, and interesting world that we have today of art, um, which is really, you know, uh, past the modern scene, to be honest with you, for, for people that are art nerds. Um, has gone into postmodernism and multiculturalism and all these other things. But we will focus on basically starting from Courbet and highlighting a different noteworthy painter uh, chronologically moving forward. So um, so today let's let's start with Courbet, right? So you've got uh, you've got this painter. It's the early 1800s um, is when he's born and he's and he's actively working. And um, talk to me a little bit, Dennis, about like who came before him, who his influences were. Well, we talk. We, uh, I would say a, a lot of uh, influence. He, there's two schools of thought prior to him, which kind of stems from the school of uh, Ang, and and then there was, of course, the school of Delacroix, and they're very, very separate, different uh, directions. Um, we could argue that that Courbet kind of more went. I would, I would, I guess this is maybe more my opinion, but I would more believe that he was uh, from the school of Delacroix. But there are other painters as well, like Jerome and Jericho, that were all either either around this time or before. Yeah, they were definitely um, either his contemporary or right before him. And I would agree with you is that to look at the way Courbet paints and stuff, Delacroix was probably a a clear um, predecessor. So, so with that, and then you've got um, just just to belabor that point a little bit more, you've got uh, Jerome, who you mentioned, who what I I would view him as kind of the the mainstream painter of the time, um, like the academia fave type thing, um, which I think you know, and the main point that we're starting with Courbet is he kind of broke with that tradition. Um, and kind of was was part of the you know was part of the club if you will, and then kind of radicalized himself, and that's kind of why we all point to him as hey he was one of the first guys that popularized the idea of being a a lone gunman of the arts you know what I mean uh, uh, of it being about him and stuff. Um, fair to say. That's fair to say, yeah. So, um, so should we go ahead and bring up one of his works? Let, let's bring up um, um, the Stonebreakers, which is always a good one to start with because it's it's a his uh, early hit in the salons. And um, when you're looking at it, and it's up on screen now. But when you're looking at it for a viewer from our world today, it doesn't seem like a very noteworthy painting. It doesn't seem all that you know radical. So um, at the time, why was this an important piece? I would say the biggest thing about it is at the time, you know, accepted art or the art that was that was shown was was mainly painted for royalty or for religious purposes or at least at the very least for the wealthy, and it and it documented either you know a major event, uh, 
well, I think a major event or a portrait of somebody very important. Uh, there, there's that's probably not all, but that's mainly what you would see. And uh, this is kind of a, a painting of of lower class people doing, you know, work. You know, something that that wasn't ordinarily captured in painting. And and there, there was definitely a, a feeling at the time that you were elevating, you know, um, the scum of the earth, if you will. I, I don't know if it was that rigid of, of a thought. Like, I don't know if they thought of them as those lowly people or anything. Sure, sure. Well, the idea... sure. Why, why celebrate this? It's probably what, what the, the especially the higher classes were thinking. Why do we want, you know, to 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 honor this? I'm sure that was a thought that some of yeah. them had. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. Is that that is really the the academic clear breaking as to why this was uh, a starting point to to look at for for paintings. Um, and yeah. in the in the secessions of Courbet's, this was his first uh, salon submission kind of work that promoted the idea of the common person. And and in all honesty, not even just common person. These were people in strict poverty. I mean, they were. They were, uh, you know, the the the, peasants. the the legend. Yeah, peasants. Exactly. the The legend of this was that you know he was so stricken and moved by this um, extreme drama of depression that he knew it would be his next big piece. So I like that's that's kind of the tale that's told about this painting, you know, and um, and that's just what it is. And again, people looking at it today. They, I mean, I think you could make the, the leap that they're in poverty, but in all honesty, it could just be farmers working the field, no big deal. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. the person today may not even think of it that way. And at the time, uh, this was an obvious thing. Uh, and, and I'll remind anyone listening that, you know, this is the very, very, very beginning days of like photography and, um, and, you know, photography being able to capture a common thing with a with a snapshot and things like that. I mean, making an image at the time was considered like you know this massive undertaking uh, for for someone to make a painting. So if you're going to spend the big money and have the materials and the workshop and the, and all that stuff, what you were producing needed to be of of a certain grandeur or else it or else it was you know, silly, right? It was a waste of your efforts. Um, and this was kind of like slapping that in the face going, well, I still went through all that effort and I'm promoting these people that are absolute nobodies. Uh, that's, it's a good point to be made. Yeah. And, and, the, and the whole, you know, this is, this is the, the majority of society as opposed to royalty or, or the wealthy who are probably just a smaller percentage you know, he's sort of putting that out there, like, you know, we, we want to celebrate what we believe to be, you know, more important. But when I mean, you're talking straight numbers, this is this is the majority. You know, this yes. is what, what people were. Yeah, this is the real man that's out there. Yeah. All right, good. Well, um, from that, let's move to another groundbreaking painting for Corvée, which is the burial um, at Ornan, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is a massive painting, and Corbet went back to his hometown of Ornan, and uh, the the big deal in this painting is that he he actually had, uh, well, all the people in the crowd are real people that are from his hometown, and uh, it's an event that would normally not be, I, I guess, a funeral of like an emperor or something would be documented this way, but uh, but the person being buried is uh, suspectively. A nobody, right? And, I believe it was his uncle or something like oh, that. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. It was Corbett's mm -hmm. uncle? I believe so. I didn't realize that. So, so, oh, well, that's even more interesting now that you say that because, so it has a personal interest to Corbett, but not really to the average viewer. Right, right. That's possible. Which, I, don't, I don't know who his uncle was, if his uncle was some very well-known person in the town, or I, I don't know anything about his uncle, but, uh, but for sure... It's a very important uh, to him, yeah. Well, that even that even deepens um, my feeling on on what I thought he was thinking, which was the you know that the, these are people that are meaningful to him, and if that if you know that point, which I didn't know before us just talking now, even even solidifies that more, is that these are people that he knew, you know, 
and they were important me, to him. You're making me wonder if I if I just had a dream and that came yeah. into my because I don't know where that would have come from. Do you, do you normally dream about Corvée's uncle? <laughs> Not normally. No. The, the, so, I'm pretty so sure you read it somewhere, right? We'll we'll we will fact check it on the website. There we go. That's but, a, that's uh, a good thing about the internet. We can check this as yeah. we're talking. I like well, that. Well, also, this is why we call the network artsy farty, right? Is because it may not be the exact thing, but but at the same time, we'll double check and let people know. But we don't we don't have PhDs in no. in Corbe, so if anybody thinks we're a reliable source, we're like the wiki. We're yeah, like the, we're the wiki. wiki yeah. history. We are a we are a video captured wiki. That's right. <laughs> so so uh, but the but the general sense and the general importance of the painting remains the same with that fact, whether it's true or not. Right? Is is that um, these were not kings or queens or or the pope or a uh, very rich uh, patron. These were normal people in his town. And um, even beyond that, they were not models pretending to be the normal people. These were the actual normal people that he would invite into his studio and ask them to sit, and he would actually paint them into the actual painting itself. Um, and at the time, it, today people go, well, that's what's the big deal about that? People do that all the time. At the time, that was not normal. Unless you were just doing like a study, and this was way grandiose compared to a study. I mean, just scale alone. So, um, uh, your thoughts on that outside of the uncle thing? Um, no, that's all I got. All, all I got is his uncle. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would also like to add that you know he, he, the, the efforts that he went through, you know, in terms of of, uh, of setting this up and getting people to pose for him, and I mean it, it, it is extraordinary what he what he did. I, you may have been sort of saying the same thing, but um, all of this for as you were saying, you know, an uh, an everyday average person's funeral, you know, is unheard of at the time. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you're right. I mean the the painting has a a um, dynamic and, and you know large scale structure, and and the the number of people is very Rembrandtish. You know what I mean? It has it has that feeling of this large group, and and there's all this coordination and style. You know, the, there's a lot of work that goes into that. So I would agree. It's not him studying his mom, and it was just a quick study, and he was just getting practice, and people kept it years later. This was obviously a well calculated, well uh, executed effort. Of just common people. Uh, I, I have uh, a fact check update for you here. Uh, <laughs> I was in fact slightly wrong. It's not his uncle. It's his grand uncle, which oh. I, I guess means it's his grandparents, one of his grandparents' brother. Yeah. Um. So close. Okay. But but still a relative. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So so it, uh, the the punch home of it being a personal uh, interest is still there. You know. So mm -hmm. and again, at this time, people didn't make make paintings for that for that reason ever. Right. Uh, it was always a funded event that was, um, you know, patronage and all that stuff. And not a celebrated event either. You know, I mean, this is this is a depressing event. And it, it, I, the fact that it's a, a collection of ordinary people, um, I think, is is really important. Yeah. No, I agree. So. Um, uh, from that, unless you had more about the the funeral painting, but I mean, obviously a great painting, um, and and it was furthering the ideas of the Stonebreakers. So for someone who's following along here, you had the Stonebreakers, which was uh, uh, important, but scale and stuff was obviously smaller than this painting. This was the same kind of idea, but it made it more personal and it and it grandiose, you know, grand made it much grander. And then uh, the next painting we're going to look at, which is not as grand in size. But it really shows a shift in the in the ego and the and the hmm. bio, if we will, of, of Corbet, is the meeting on the road, and um, this was a painting that uh, I know that we were drilled in school on um, when when I was at Mass Art, um, because this was the painting where he was kind of declaring, you know what, and and for folks listening, this is what we all expect of artists today. But at the time, the, the artist was simply a, a means to an end, right? And um, uh, you know, speak to this a little bit. I mean, I, I want to. I don't want to do all the talking on it. For the most part, you're right. I mean, the, the the artists were generally commissioned by the wealthy, or even even you know, 
or royalty, and they were to do what they were told. I mean, they they learned they 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 learned their trade and they they followed the rules for yeah. the most part. And this is sort of him snubbing his nose at it. And I think one of the <laughs> one of the best parts about it is it you know he. he He's there in the foreground, you know, you can tell by him carrying his easel on his back. Um, and then these other two people, whether they're art buyers or... or they know, were the patrons of the painting. Okay, the patrons of the painting. They're, they're sort of looking down and almost bowing to him while his head is upward, right? I just, yeah. just that, the whole, the whole uh, stance or the, the, the body language in this painting is beautiful. Yeah, it, it, and it's very telling. I mean, people now... Here's another thing that I always like to tell, you know, um, people that see it with me when I'm at a museum is that, you know, they, there's no TV at the time. There's no, there's no such thing as TV. Photographs are around, but they're rare, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a, uh, imagine a world where the only images on paper and canvas stuff that you see are paintings like that. That's what you're relegated to, right? So people of this time were much more in tune with the subtleties that today people go, well, I wouldn't think of him putting his chin up as meaning something mm -hmm. or, or that the, or that the other two figures in the painting are smaller than the painter himself, which at the time would have been very weird. And so in today that, you know, because they see so much media hitting them in all these different ways. And a lot of the media is so um, daily and, and repetitive that meanings like that aren't studied. You know what I mean? It just it's just a dynamic. Well, and, and to add to that, I would say you know take a look at some of the other pictures that show you know Napoleon or some some emperor or or even religious right when there's when there's Jesus or Mary with with people around them and check out the 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 positioning of of heads and that's in those situations where. Yeah. You know the the power the power goes to the person whose whose head is up. You know, and and yeah. those that are worshiping or or uh, I don't know what the word would be for for you know what you would do to Napoleon underneath him, but you know yeah. you, you would be looking <laughs> down. Um, well, you know. there's, there's definitely a hierarchy. There's a there's a pictorial hierarchy, if you will, yep. um, and, to pictures, and, and, and that's still true for paintings today. But it, it's kind of a conversation that just artsy, fartsy people talk about, right? I mean, it, it's not really, you know, if someone's making a, a painting and, and you buy it in your house, the average, you know, viewer isn't really judging it based on, well, this character is dominant because they're doing, you know what I mean? Like, they're, they're not having those conversations the way they did back then. It was not so prevalent to the, to the masses. Um, and, and like I like to tell people, you know, going to the salon was going to the movies, like this was this was a form of entertainment, a form of they called it culture, and we still call it culture now. Go to the movies, we call it culture, right? Mm -hmm. But at the time, this was like date night, right? This was the getting out and going and seeing something that you can't see anywhere else. And uh, and your house wasn't littered with photos and 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 posters and anything else that you want. I mean, this was a real treat to go out and see these things. So because of that, people spent time to really digest the meaning and all this other stuff, you know. Um, so with that, you know, and again, not to not to belabor this painting too much because it's kind of a, it's a very fascinating painting to show where the mind of Corbet was, which is he was becoming much more um, egocentric, right? Right. right. He, he was definitely. Um, he was turning into the businessman Corbet of, hey, it's about me, man, right? We're, we're gonna, we're, well, you're buying this painting now because you wanted a Corbet. And, and he's flipping that on itself to, uh, um, to justify that, right? Speak to that. So, oh, you're asking me to say something about it? Yeah. Are you, are you not hearing me now? We're at, well, yeah, I've got the heat kicking on here where I am. And, oh, is uh, that what I'm hearing? <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think everything you said is pretty true. This is this is one of the bi biggest things to note about this is how it's like an obvious shift in him being bold enough to to illustrate or, uh, you know, show us his ego, which yeah. is great. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a it's a. 
it's a growth in him. You know, it's a, I, I'm, I'm going to stand here and tell you that artists are just as important as anybody. I mean, it's, in a way, it's, it sounds very egotistical, but on the other side, you could argue that he's, he's trying to put a shift on, on who's important all, all around, meaning we all are. You know, so so you could be saying he's trying to take away some of it from royalty and wealthy people, right. and just sort of distribute it to everybody, which I think is also an you know. Well, a, and I think it speaks to the to the culture of the time where he was he was um, in a in a society that had such a tight control over over this whole creative process that he almost had to be overboard the other way. To, to open people's eyes to it, to, to break it apart. You know what I mean? That, that he, I mean, he was a very, very charismatic personality to begin with. And, and it was almost like the only fight they had against a locked-in system that would shuffle you away if you didn't fit the salon type. And, and he really was part of that group of guys that just destroyed that whole way of thinking. I mean, the salon becomes incre or decreasingly important after Corbin, I mean, I think that's a, a, a definitely a, a fair statement. So, yeah. so this is this is a small piece, but it, it's a worthwhile painting to, to you know note as as important. Um, so now let's let's move on to the big one, the one that everybody always uh, refers to Corbin for, is um, and and this is truly what I was always taught as the the um, breaking point. Right, the app, the the painting that really exploded into the Big Bang of, of modern painting, which is the My Studio painting, um, that has a, a tremendously long name, and I'll, I will say the whole thing here in a second. It's um, the My Studio, a real allegory of seven year phase of my artistic and moral life, <laughs> which uh, which is you know just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> And if you read into it, you can probably come up with a lot of, uh, you know, possible scenarios. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I'm sure you know there's, a, I'm sure there's a, uh, there's a serious side to that, and there's a poking fun at the whole uh, salon at that also. So, and, and in all honesty, this painting kind of is all about that, right? Is a, it's a, it's a surmising of, of all the art history lessons leading up to this point. And and we'll dive into it here for a minute, but uh, but you know, um, let we'll pull up the screen, you know, pull up the painting here, and basically what you're looking at when you're looking at this painting is go through it with me, Dennis. You got a self-portrait. Mm-hmm. You got a nude. Yep. You've got a a child looking at the nude. Right, right. Um, which is which is a little weird for the time, right? Yep, and there's a, a pet down below him. A pet. I assume the pile of 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 cloth is is the clothing from the nude, or or yeah, or something to do with that. Anyway, did then, I mention landscape? You got landscape. Oh yeah, the landscape painting, and then it, that's sort of a dividing point between the right and the left side of the painting, and on the right hand side of the painting looks to be more upper class people. Yeah. Um. And on the left-hand side, it seems to be more, you know, working-class people. I don't know much about you. You, the boy is down there drawing is supposedly Monet, right? You said, and he's he's a big he's a big admirer of uh, oh, yeah. even as a child, a big admirer yeah. of Courbet. I don't know much about Monet's upbringing or or, or where he stood. Well. In, and I would say um, that Monet wasn't necessarily a child when he was following Courbet. Cor you know, Courbet was a was definitely at this time, by this time, was the talk of the town in Paris, right? And uh, Cor um, I'm sorry, Monet. I don't think he was a boy that young. I think he was like you know, late teens, early twenties. When he was, when he was, you know, the, the the fabled tales of Monet, you know, finding out where Corbet was going to be hanging out in the cafes and trying to get the table next to him and stuff like that. Um, and and I've read, you know, a variety of things like that. But I think Corbet put him in as a child, just kind of indicating the fact that this is the next generation. Um, you know, more of a more of a metaphor for where the future of art is going. 
Uh, and that's how I've always perceived the way that he put that in there, you know. Um, also, I always understood that even on uh, not, I don't know about the the working class side of the painting, but I've always understood that the uh, right side of the painting, the, the bourgeoisie, that there were actual real people and famous people in there that were of the art crowd. So you had right, I, be I believe that. Yeah, you had poets and you had you know people like that that were represented. Um, um, so, I mean, Baudelaire is one that's in there, you know, so the other thing that's big is in the middle of all this. So we're talking about all these things that represent different parts of painting, right? And of course, here's where the ego strikes again. In the middle of all of this, who do we have? Corbett, that's right. He's right? got to be center stage. You got it. He is, he is the focal point of the painting. All, all roads lead to Courbet in his mind. And and in all fairness, if you're studying modern art, they do kind of all lead back to Courbet. Especially right? at that time, you're right. I mean, he's showing us, uh, you know, more to the left of the painting. There's, you know, different pieces of different, you know, like there's a, there's a figure hanging behind and there's a, a thing with a skull on it. You know, the little pieces of... But I guess potential history, you know, history of painting. He's kind yeah. of kind of hinting at that, and and trying to place himself within history. I think, um, and it's not inaccurate. You know, it, it may sound egotistical, but it's it's not necessarily inaccurate because he's he's kind of doing a little bit of a history leading up to himself. And if 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 that's you know, it could have been anybody at that time, I suppose, and it would have been just as accurate, but. You know the fact that he sees himself as as the center of 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 the art movement at the time. That's that's where it's probably some of this is coming from. Yeah, and, and I mean it, it's it's um, you're exactly right. Is that there's there's part of this that he could see it was leading to this because this isn't exactly like you know no one never heard of him at this point. He was definitely famous by this time time, and he was definitely like in the crowd of cutting edge artists. But he's also being prophetic that 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 would last. I mean, I mean that's that's a big statement. That'd be that'd be you and I sitting there going, you know what? Everyone's gonna follow me. Like like that is not something that most artists would put their life on the line to say. Well, most artists aren't real famous until they're long gone, you know. And and, and he was one that was was lucky to to enjoy, uh, you know, fame in his lifetime. But it's not the typical life of an artist to have that. We, as we will see as we go through the modern art tree, right? <laughs> I mean, right. The, the vast majority of them are scraping by, and then only in their either twilight years or, or after they're gone is there any recognition for what they suffered through, you know? So, so yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. He is, um, I don't want to say he's the last, because obviously you've got artists past him that made big big money and were very very famous oh yeah like life. picasso and, and oh yeah well i mean monet monet was very comfortable towards the end of his life you know um so i don't want to pretend that these so artists far, but all suffered but at the same time you're going to see a definitely a change in that where uh um from this point the idea of what's a grand painting and what's a meaningful painting scale starts to change on us right and the other thing that from this painting forward changes dramatically, if you ask me, is why you're painting. The reason to paint totally changes because you've got a guy who framed himself into art history. Now all the painters are wondering what their contribution to art history is instead of just trying to make paintings itself. Right. Well, and, and let me let me just put that into simpler terms. He's paint. That's right. He's painting for him, not for. A wealthy person or royalty right. you know he, this is the shift right this is where he's finally saying we can do work that we find important we don't need to be told what we need to paint yeah i mean uh, the easy ex easiest example i can think of, of this is the is the uh, cathedral paintings that monet did later there's a there's a clear artist who's making a series of paintings for a quasi scientific reason, right? Right, right, yeah. I agree. And I mean, there's no patron involved. No one's, you know, I mean, I mean, he may have had people lined up that willing were willing to buy them, but no one asked him to go paint the cathedral at all hours of the day right. from the same stationary place. No one was intending to buy, you know, 20 of these paintings. No, so, that was that's more the the <laughs> 
as a, as artists, you know, we probably understand some of this. I mean, you you work on something for any length of time, and the light changes so so quickly that it gets a little frustrating. So what what I was told about his is a lot of those paintings of say those cathedrals. I, I know this is for another uh, another yeah. uh, uh, a preview, podcast, but. <laughs> But he his he would do he would have them going all simultaneously. So he'd do for so much for say a half hour to an hour a day one, then shift to the next, and then shift to the next, so that he was getting the different light in each different piece. And uh, it's 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 pretty interesting. You're right, but it is but, very scientific. But that but that idea, that methodology, that way of thinking about painting, that people will be interested in the fact that I'm doing this, was not even in the conversation at this point or before right. this point. Because that's not why we did painting. That's not why right. painting existed. That wasn't what, what the masses, or you know, the, I shouldn't say the masses, because the masses didn't even have the opportunity to think about right. what painting should be. But the people who dictated it, which were the wealthy or, the, or you know, the royals, um, they they that's not what they saw it it doing. That's not how they saw it. Yeah, and that that pretty much sums up Courbet right there. I mean that that's why he's a pinnacle place to start that's why he's a great place to start right. for, for a big, this, uh, a, a definitely a break from from you know the breaking point which yeah. is why he's considered by some the the grandfather of modern art yeah no i and i would agree with that so so that is our uh we're, we're at 31 minutes so this is perfect um we, so the the attempt is to try and snapshot these artists in about a half an hour and that the, we, we're right on point so um this will lead to our artist uh, for next week, which uh, is undisclosed at this moment because we still have to decide who we want to do. But it, but this uh, this can chronologically spiral out as anybody can expect. And um, so far, my interest in trying to link them through the shows is by stylistic approach and then keeping it chronological at that point. So um, um, thank you, Dennis. I mean, this, I think this was a great first show, and uh, we'll be doing many, many more. <laughs> You're very welcome. I look forward to to the rest of these as well. All right, great. Thanks. I'll talk